Uh, yeah, you covered a lot of issues. Like I, I prepared to uh, talk about uh, you know, racism. I guess uh, the when when is racism uh, good or bad? You covered a lot of uh, things, kind of like the alt right, uh, Otto Paul maintaining internet friendships, working relationships, whether uh, you know, you become friendly with the associates, and, and certainly you know that's something uh, yeah I've thought about and mentioned quite often, and send like you know business that uh, I don't mind working together with people I don't like, and more productivity. When I work together with people, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of people in business that have uh, made bad decisions by uh, choosing, you know, people that they like as opposed to who are productive. I think we've even talked about that uh, in the past. And then, you know, I, I'm not much of a Tucker person, but, uh, you know, I see the recurring theme of violence and immigration and uh, you know those are huge issues you're the one who turned me on to uh how important immigration was because like generally i'm still pro-immigration but uh you know certainly you that uh you turned me to realize uh how important immigration you know is to the fabric of america yeah a lot, a lot of different topics that we could uh, pick up on but maybe we'll we'll tackle the the topic of uh friendship and it's it's you have to use very good judgment on who you bring into your life i mean you you bring someone too close and they can absolutely upend your life because we're all incredibly vulnerable right none of us are protected and so uh there there are some people that I, i've worked with for years and had you know just an instrumental working relationship other people that i worked next to for one day and we we very quickly become friends so any thoughts on kind of navigating that when do you bring people into your life when do you become friends when do you deliberately choose to keep people at arm's length yeah i guess i mean certain relationships have utility and the friendship doesn't necessarily matter, you know. So, like, you know, Duvid does a good job, shows up on time, you know, does what I say, um, you know, pays on time, pays in full. Yeah, I got a hundred percent sellers rating on uh, eBay. You know, you various things like in terms of working together, whether you like me or not. So, okay, this guy's trustworthy to uh, do a good job, do do what I say. And that's pretty important. A lot of times friendships don't actually have utility. Um, although there is the concept of someone who's going to be there for you. So in the Jewish community, a lot of times also, it's not your friends who are going to be there for you. There's people in the community that kind of like helping people out that you could call and make themselves available. Uh, you know, ask kind of or however they might be referred to. So, you know, God forbid, you know, like your Hatsala volunteer or just the person in synagogue who's always setting things up. And you might not be friendly with the person, but uh, you know, might help you out. Versus when you're on the more fringe of the community or secular, you need friends to help you out because, like, there's really no one to help you out. Like, you know, if you're secular, like right now, I, I got no one to help me. Like, I got a few friends from a few years ago. Maybe I could call, but it's like, God forbid. I better not get sick. I better not, uh, you know, have my car break down or various things because I don't know who I'd call uh, for help because it's a cold, dark world there. And so in New York, you had to uh, feed friends to uh, make sure that someone's going to be there for when you when you need. And that could include the investment of large sums of money and doing favors to others. Like, you know, there's many people that... Uh, I bought lunch for and food for hundreds of times. Uh, you maybe not hundreds of times, but possibly. And you know, never, uh, never, you know, they never really did anything for me like that. But it's like if I needed something, they would be there for me. Like, okay, I'm moving, um, or, or various things where I might need somebody. That this person's like, I'll be there for you. I owe you. Uh, you know, you're my friend like that. So, you know, you there in the big city. Um, you know, I try to make myself independent here and then just say like, okay, I'll, like if I need help, I'll pay somebody. 
Uh, but, uh, you know, sometimes it's hard to get uh, things for pay or the expense. Like if you need, you need someone to do moving for you and you have to pay, it could be like $50 or, or a huge, a huge price. And even my friends, if I can, I'll usually pay them. Um, but uh, I don't know if, uh, you know, you feel that like in L.A. where you've invested huge amounts into people largely just so they'll be there for you. Wow, that's uh, that's a great question. Uh, I I'll start by just saying I kind of envy those people who who have never lost a friend. So there are people like Dennis Prager who claims he's never lost a friend in his life. So I, I envy that. I have found that I've lost friends frequently when I simply take a controversial position, and or I, I choose to write about something and and people disapprove. Uh, so I guess the, the burning core of my life for about 25 years, are the friends that I have in Orthodox Judaism, that's my substitute family. And so I have friends in Orthodox Judaism who I've retained since I moved to Los Angeles in March of 1994. So that's, that's the most important part of my life in, in Los Angeles. When, when I go back to Australia, I have friends there from childhood and I have family and relatives. So that's then becomes the, the most important part of, of my life. But the, the relationships that I've built up from 27, 28 years living in and around Beverly Hills, I mean, th these are people that I sometimes see in synagogue every day that we've, you know, attended uh, Torah study classes, you know, dozens, hundreds of times that we've uh, prayed together, that we've uh, volunteered together. We, we've brought meals to people. Uh, we've, you know, served in, in various uh, positions in the community together. I mean, that's, that's the most important part. Now, I, I value those friendships and I value community, but I also put a tremendous value on my freedom of expression. So I've kind of allowed, allowed myself to say almost everything I want to say, right? There's very little that I've just held back from saying. But with regard to my my Orthodox Jewish community, I do take a little more care in how I phrase some things to you know, maintain these most important relationships. So by, by taking more care in phrasing things and, you know, deliberating on, on how I say things, that, that's, you know, perhaps a price that I pay for uh, having, ha having a very, you know, pleasant, familial relationship with uh, Orthodox Judaism. But I, I do recognize that e eternal tension between freedom to, to say what you think and, and believe and also maintaining community. And I kind of try to steer towards a middle road. I give up some freedom for community and I give up some community for for freedom. So, yeah, I've lost you know, friends. Like controversial, I mean, because we're, we're like YouTube friends. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I mean, you mean like controversial political stuff or you mean like... Uh, personal stuff like you have a habit of blurting out um upsetting things like you know like uh, are you putting on weight or like you know like i've noticed you're losing some air or uh you know like you know god forbid your wife's a real pain or i mean you're talking about personal stuff like that that you you have a hard time uh um i, I did have or a are you hard talking time. about your political views yeah no i i did have a hard time with some of the the personal stuff about uh 25 years ago I, I, but uh, that hasn't been as much of a problem over the past uh, 20 years. But no, I'm talking about the things that I write about. So, for example, I lost all my friends in Los Angeles when I decided to write a daily column on Dennis Prager. They, they thought it was a tremendous betrayal of Dennis Prager's friendship. And because Prager was, you know, far more prestigious and influential, they, they all sided with him and they all turned their back on me. So I, I lost about 15 friends, every, every friend I had in Los Angeles, simply because I wanted to write in, in an objective way about Dennis. So before I made that decision, I remember I was part of a, I think a Facebook group where we discussed Dennis Prager's radio show. And the one time that I made a criticism of Dennis, the, the first time I ever made a criticism of Dennis, like he objected to it. He said, you know, I get enough criticism on my show and with regard to my show, I don't need my friends criticizing me. And so I realized that if I was going to discuss things that Dennis Prager said on his show at all, that I, I 
essentially couldn't do it unless I was just willing to be a Prager lackey, uh, a Prager fan. And so that, that possibility was just way too uh, discouraging or daunting for me. It's like, no, I'm not going to limit myself to never saying anything critical about what Dennis talks about on his, his radio show. And so I had to, I had to suffer the loss of all my friends in Los Angeles because I wouldn't put up with that stricture of I could never criticize anything Dennis says uh, publicly. Yeah, okay. I lived in New York for years. I assume in L.A., you know, and saying, like, I mean, you're pretty open about your lack of uh, financial success. And probably like me, you've trained yourself to be largely self-sufficient. But what about you know, just the necessity of having people uh, there for you if it means like you know couch couch surfing uh needing to borrow a little money someone to pick you up from uh the airport uh I, i've never was... thought of myself as self-sufficient i've always had a very keen awareness of how i need people for possibly those things and i have had people come through for me uh when i was moving about uh, 12 years ago i stayed with one friend for a week and with another friend for another week and i think it was the first time either of them had had someone ask you know can can i stay with you because i couldn't afford a hotel and so it was it out of the blue or saying this was a friend that you had maintained a relationship and you knew that like you did things for them and that they would very likely uh, you know, do things for you. And like, okay, I lived in New York and I had countless, you know, tens, maybe hundreds of people stay in my apartment a day or two. I'd lent money, given away money, you know, given a meal to, uh, I gave rights to thousands of people and, uh, you know, various things that you know, like, God, thank God I did a lot more for other people than I uh, needed help for myself. And it's better to be in that situation. But, uh, you know, there are, a handful of people that I regularly ask for things. Um, I tried to not be that needy, uh, but uh, you know, there are times I was needy and I had friends where I was like, yeah, like we've helped each other out so many times and I've lost touch with those people or fell apart or things could break the relationship. Like, you know, if you're in the Dennis Prager click and you say something bad or, or a lot of times in Judaism, like that, you know, the, um, you know, if you're part of a synagogue or a group together and you're no longer part of the same group, uh, but, you know, I would assume in L.A. that it's important to have maintain relations and you have to use what you have. So if you have money, you might, uh, you know, use money to say, well, I know you don't have that much money. And, uh, you know, I bought you lunch 100 times. And, you know, so when I move or, or something like I expect you to help me. And it could also be like, uh, you know, porn or, or like a girlfriend getting somebody into the party or, or something where, where, you know, like uh, there's some sort of you know, just kind of like two Jewish boys uh, scheming and dreaming about the world who uh, you who are going to be there for each other. I don't know if that, you know, if you had you know, friends like that, I know you wrote in your book, uh, you know, God forbid about the person who lent you money to uh, make your first porn video or something. God forbid. I'm just thinking <laughs> about what you put in your book. Yeah. I, I like, I I've really been disappointed when I, ask people for help because it's been so so rare so those two people that i i stayed with for a week uh th these were people i'd had strong friendships with for for many years now i remember my my best friend in los angeles so he was the one i didn't lose when i started writing on dennis prager uh he had really bad credit and so i i got a credit card that i was responsible for but he was going to use it and pay me back well as you can imagine, he didn't pay me back. And so he ran off something like six, $700 without paying me back. And I, I canceled his card. Then he became furious. Never, it's never paid me back the money t to this day. And that took a pretty severe toll on our friendship. So I, I maintained uh, friendly relations with him for about another five, six, seven years after that. But that that really took a toll and that other people who turned their back on me when i started writing about dennis prager um i resumed you know a, a low level of friendship with them uh with with some of them uh but the last last painful friend that i lost uh, of which i'm i'm aware a real life friend not talking about an internet friend who i've never met but i did lose a real life friend in 2008 and uh this person said here's the feeling in my home I don't trust you. 
my kids fear you and my wife hates you. And so that was a very painful uh, loss of a friendship. But I, I realized that it wasn't primarily about me, that this was someone who had a, a fear of, of friendship. And this was, you know, his own, his own stuff in part. And, and I, I'm sure there are things, things about me in part. And then I remember once, only once have I had a girlfriend who had contempt for me. And uh, I had a girlfriend for about a year, it just exuded just incredible amounts of contempt for me. She thought, for example, that I had uh, the, you know, very low pain threshold. And the physical therapist who was working with me who was doing all this very painful manipulation said, you know, you've got a very high pain threshold. But because I'd simply mentioned to my girlfriend that I was going to the physical therapist, she, she just thought I was a wimp. And again, I was able to realize her loathing for me had to do with her childhood. It wasn't really about me. She grew up with a father who was incredibly sexually promiscuous. And she grew up where her, her Jewish father was banging all these Amazon blondes in you know, the next room in these very thin Manhattan apartments. And so she developed this, you know, loathing and fear of men. So th those were two very painful relationships, but I was able to understand that the loss of those relationships was not primarily about me. Well, we're on the subject, you know, maybe put it more into business professional relations, you know, or bring it back to YouTube, but, uh, you know, think, okay, I did party promotion and, uh, even just in Jewish circles, not related to uh, business, there's a lot of networking and exchanging of favors, you know, just like Shabbos meals, like, you know, who on the scene is having guests and you'll tell somebody about, uh, you know, some, uh, you know, wealthy or prominent person that, um, you know, has a lot of Shabbos guests and would probably have you in exchange information, you know, like Schnorr's exchange information. And then, you know, certainly on the party scene, like connecting people to uh, contacts, you know, if it's, uh, you know, music promotion and, uh, you know, club owners or bands or studios or any various things where it's kind of known like, okay, I'm giving you this contact and that's a favor. I, I, you know, mention on my stream pretty often, you know, God forbid, when I day trade, I had this roommate who was making a lot of money. He was pretty generous. He'd buy food for everybody and hook people up, but occasionally he would want a favor. And every time he did, he would like guilt you and he would list every single time he ever did something for you. You're like, I bought you food that one time. I gave you a ride that one time. How dare you not do this for me? And like, it's got to be like that in Hollywood and like, you know, so like networking, if you're like, Oh, you got the, I don't know if you like, you know, cell numbers or emails, or can you put me in contact with this person where maybe you're not even friends with the uh, people, but uh, you know, there's just this. That's relation. never happened to me. That's never happened to me. I've never, I've never said to anyone who can't help me out or come through with a favor. Look, I did so many things for you. Why can't you help me out? That's just never happened. I mean, people have said no to me, but I guess my Anglo-Saxon reserve, I would never, uh, never point out, look, I've done X, Y, Z for you. And on the other hand, I, I can't think of examples of where people have said, look, I've done so much for you. Well, yeah, I can think of a handful of examples where people have said, like rabbis have said, Once look, I read your book. You, know, read, you talk about yeah. how you, how you porn blogged. And you said it was basically a strategic exchange of information where you gave people information, they gave you information. It may not be like favors, but that's how you you know, you say you stayed on top of your game was by largely just exchanging information. People would give you information in return for you giving them information enough that you were a top blogger on the issue. Right. I, I think as, as as someone who's more genetically Jewish than I am and had more Jewish connections growing up, you, you may be more explicit about things that in my Anglo-Saxon reserve, I tend to make implicit. So I can never imagine saying to anyone, look, I've done X, Y, Z for you. Therefore, you need to do this for me. I mean, not that I wouldn't, but it, it's just hard for me to imagine. It's really difficult to imagine. Uh, on the other hand, there are, you know, a handful of occasions, like particularly rabbis who said, look, I, I've stuck my neck out for you or, you know, I, I, I'm asking you this as a personal favor. And so that I, I've usually succumbed, you know, whenever, whenever a rabbi has made that sort of appeal to me, I've, I've succumbed to it. But 
it, there's there's really explicitly been the kind of accounting that you describe and i think i'm pretty good at reading people so it it's fairly rare that i'm i'm surprised by someone well if it's implicit and you say okay you know, both me and you generally rolled alone but for periods of time when i was more active like you can't roll alone and so even if it's not explicit it's implicit that you got a buddy and you're both networking and you know trying to meet people and you're going to hook each other up and like i mean i assume that's how hollywood works and you know like you're making contacts meeting people getting into parties and if you work together with a buddy it's kind of implicit that you're going to uh share your contacts with each other well many of the the circles that i've i've run in doesn't quite work that way because I, I most of my social circles have been writers and unless you've you've reached a certain level of, of accomplishment in the writing world you can't you can't ask another writer out for for coffee or lunch i mean it's just considered absurd so for whatever reason you know many highly accomplished you know prestigious writers have viewed me as a peer and but if i had a girlfriend who, who was very pretty but not accomplished as a writer when when she would try to network with the accomplished writers that, that i knew they would look askance at it they would be they would think it was absurd they would they would consider her her a climber who, who hadn't paid her her dues so my social circles primarily being writers and they would almost always have like you know certain levels of expectation for accomplishment before they would view you as a peer and so i couldn't i couldn't hook anyone up with my social circle of, of writers they were not going to you know welcome someone in who didn't have a body of work that they respected yeah i mean god forbid you know i mean i mean you think where there's like illegal activity like uh, drug use or sexual activity where people want to keep things private but uh you know, generally, I'm thinking in New York that it's extremely common that you're with somebody and there's parties and there's social things and you might get invited or, you know, know the person to just show up and you bring somebody with you, even like a, a Sabbath meal. And if you're saying writers are specifically different, where, where it'd be kind of weird to, uh, you know, just be like, oh, you know, I, you know, I brought this person with me. And, uh, but I mean, that... Isn't that pretty I don't normal? bring people along. That that's just not something I I do. Uh, hardly, Isn't that phenomenon normal. Like, well, pretty normal? I that guess that thing. is a normal thing, but I don't do it. I don't. I don't. If I'm going to a party or a gathering or a dinner or or a meetup, I'm not someone who brings people along. I'm not someone who says, "Hey, there's a Shabbat meal here that you could come to." That's fairly rare. Occasionally, I'll do it, but generally speaking, I would feel again, the Anglo-Saxon reserve, you know, I don't know whether the host would approve, whether the, the people that I'm going to be meeting would approve. So it's, it's fairly rare that I hook people up that way. Even there in Hollywood, you were more with writers, people that wouldn't, you really be that interested for people like, oh, you're famous, you want to meet them, that, uh, that you would even have power to, uh, you know, to be like, uh, you know, like I could introduce you to this person and, and in terms of the writing world it might be like finances like you're like uh if you, you either have money or you don't you either have the writing skills or you don't so it's no advantage for you to meet this person it's not like meeting an actor where you're gonna you know get to post a selfie or brag to your friends well often with writers they'd want sources so they'd want to talk to someone in the jewish community who knows xyz or they want to talk to someone in the porn industry or they want to talk to you know a movie producer or someone i, I might know in the criminal underworld so i've often helped out writers with the potential sources or contact information for for people so i i help people out that way but i don't generally speaking bring them along to gatherings if they haven't been invited yeah, I mean, that's interesting. I, you know, typically I didn't either, but uh, um, I was brought along a lot of times. Um, and, and then, you know, when I actually got into promoting where you, you got to gather people, you got to sell tickets, you got to network, and it's expected, you know, because, like, you want to do big things you want to accomplish. And so you have an entourage. And we talked about this, you know, dealing with difficult people. And, 
you know, as the the more prominent you are, the more likely it is you travel with an entourage and the more leeway you're given. So like, you know, Luke Ford, the famous Luke Ford, you know, of course he's going to be arriving with an entourage. And uh, honestly, I have no idea who's in his entourage, but uh, you know, he's such a famous person that, uh, you know, I, I will host whoever's in his entourage. I assume in, you know, Hollywood, that's pretty normal. Uh, maybe, but it's not a, it's not a game I've played and I've, I virtually never had an entourage. I, I, I tend to have a small number of very in, intense close friends and I, I don't have an entourage. I have like, uh, two, two or three really strong friendships in, in Los Angeles. And when I go back to say Sydney, Australia, I've got uh, another handful of, of close, strong friendships, I, I, but I've never really had an entourage. You think that might have limited your financial success, even thinking like social events, uh, traveling in circles where uh, you have people, especially if you have business dealings with a person and your financial partners with somebody and then you bring someone with them. It's like, oh, who's this person? He, he's my business partner. And, you know, certain aspect of why do you have an entourage? Because uh, he works for me. And I'm not sure if you're thinking about that. And, you know, God forbid you've mentioned your, you know, one of your failings has, has been your failings and releasing your earning potential. If you think that's possibly related to. Yes, uh, definitely. Definitely. I don't, I don't tend to hook people up. I mean, I do it a little bit. But it's not one of my characteristics. I tend to like to keep people in, in separate compartments. So there are people that I live stream with, but I would never ask people that I dubbin with to, to come on a live stream. And I mean, there, there are people that I work with, but I would never ask them either to come on a live stream or to come dubbin with me. So I, I guess I tend, I've always tended to carve my life up into separate compartments. And it's often made me feel awkward and ill at ease when people from various segments of my life suddenly all come together in one place. Have you ever had a business partner like that where you were in regular daily contact with the person out of necessity of managing your mutual business instincts no. or interests? No, never, never had a, a business partner. I'm not, I'm not someone cut out for, for partnership. I either want to be in charge or I want someone else to be in charge. Yeah. I mean, you like, we could tie this back to even like Tucker Carlson, the issues of the day, or what we were, you know, t even talking about with the yeshiva and communalism. Jews are naturally adept at framing things of why this is your advantage, and you know, networking, or uh, you know, turning things into uh, mutual beneficial trade-offs, um, including business. Including, you know, like I said, the, you know, you know, God forbid, uh, you know, the guy I work for who met uh, Donald Trump, he didn't really care that Donald Trump was a celebrity. He wanted to make money. He wanted to get involved in real estate deals. You know, another guy, he wanted to close a mortgage deal. He wanted to meet Donald Trump so that he could convince him to use him as his mortgage broker and that he could make a deal. And, uh, you know, there's all sorts of connect connection, networking, party uh, you know, meeting pretty girls, uh, get, getting into better social standing. Um, but even all aspects of the Jewish community, especially the Orthodox community, because it's a mitzvah to help a person out with their uh, parnasa, that, that you would know, almost be, you know, like, well, I'm just help, trying to help this guy with parnasa. And, uh, you, you know, so there's always this, uh, you know, even call it a shotkin, like a shotkin who makes a marriage match, who makes a uh, a business match and then you know the little arm twisting where it could be pretty normal just to frame like you know it's in your interest to do this and even think like immigration you know your your typical you know jew even me uh, when we first started talking it was like no no you don't understand we're going to bring all these immigrants to america and it's going to be in your best Im interest these people at the border you know like it's in your best interest to let them in the country and you know it's kind of a natural jewish thing to do to just uh, be able to frame things uh, like, uh, you know, like you don't understand this is in your best interest. Yeah, I, I think it's much more of an Anglo-Saxon thing to have people in separate compartments. So Anglo-Saxons 
more frequently, I think, have people that they work with, then people that they socialize with, and then people that they pray with, and then people who share common interest in cricket, and then other people that they share a common interest in painting. While, while Jews are much more warm and much more Hamish and much more friendly and like, you know, bring people together. And so it's, it's much more common that, you know, people that you may work with or for or, or who are clients, you know, you bring them to a Shabbat meal and then you invite them to shul and you might, you know, go on vacations together. And so Jewish life, particularly traditional Jewish life is much more interlocking, much more intense than the Anglo-Saxon world in, in which I was raised. Yeah, it's good for business. It's good for, you know, net, it's good for networking, which is good for uh, your profit, no matter what your business is, you know, even your dentist, a doctor, uh, but especially, uh, you know, the professions like we're talking like yeshiva alumni that end up in, uh, you know, fields where it's largely completely networking, even, you know, the people in construction uh, management, life insurance sales, stock brokerage, mortgage, mortgage brokerage. And even a lot of the top people don't really know what they're doing. I'm not sure if you know the business terminology. They have like, uh, you know, the whales and the hooks and the finisher. So if you're, you know, at the life insurance firm or the mortgage brokerage firm, you'll have the finisher. So the person's just, you know, he's got the uh, pizzazz, the sales, and he'll get the person interested. And once the person's interested, he'll have you talk to, uh, you know, the guy who actually knows what he's doing at uh, at the firm. Uh, you know, like if it's a mortgage or life insurance, who's actually going to give you the numbers or the details. And that also, you know, applies to an entourage. Well, why do you need the entourage? Because, like, I don't actually know what I'm doing. Like, I'm just a big mouth who uh, likes networking. But, uh, you know, it's this other guy that actually knows what he's doing. And that's how we make the money. And that's why we got to, you know, travel together. Yeah. How long will you put up with a Shabbat dinner that's boring or someone at shul who's who's boring? So I bail from Shabbat dinners that are boring. I bail from conversations with people that are boring. I'll you know, just leave the conversation and pick up a book and start reading it. So I don't have a lot of patience for, for people. How about you? Um. I've trained myself to be very patient, but, uh, you know, I'm multitask. I'll pick up, pick up a book or read. And, yeah, I mean, generally I'm a loner. I try to avoid those situations. Um, but, yeah, I mean, patience is something I have to work on. And that would I actively would have to uh, struggle with. Um, but like I said, like, uh, you know, especially when you're in the big city, you know you're going to need people. And you might even know what you're going to need those people for. And uh, you have to groom and invest in those people. And if it's, uh, you know, you, if you want to be rich, you know, you have to, uh, you have to uh, get your geeky friends into, uh, you know, into the parties. You have to, you know, hook them up with a, with a girl. You have to, uh, you know, look out for them. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, skill in management to, uh, you know, knowing what type of people you need around you and then keeping, uh, you know, keeping them uh, satisfied. And like I said, if you like, uh, it's probably something that has diminished your ability for earning, uh, earning potential. And you think like, okay, like, you know, God for I mean, if it's even imaginable that, you know, if it's possible that uh, 20 years ago, you could have got a life insurance, uh, you know, like a brokerage license and this whole time, that you were doing this other stuff, you were like selling life insurance on the side. And, and, uh, but you know, stuff like that is always possible. And if you, you know, you think about uh, how you could have lived life differently or even in the future that, uh, you know, that's what it takes to, uh, you know, to, uh, run a business and, and it's a drag on you that said like, it's unlikely you would have been able to accomplish, uh, you know, seeing or meeting all the people that you met if you were held down, by business relations if you had to call somebody every day and uh, you know go over your uh, business interests right i've had a lot of people say something similar to, to the effect that if you know if they knew all the people that i knew you know they'd be making millions of dollars so i i am acquainted with you know a lot of you know powerful prestigious influential people and 
it, it's just goes completely against my Anglo-Saxon tendencies to try to monetize all the the social relationships that that I have. So yeah, a lot of people have commented work. that. Yeah, sorry. I mean, if you were trying to, you probably it, it would limit. They probably you know because when you're powerful or have money, you you have to uh, weed out the people or compartmentalize your financial relationships is like no I'm, I'm you know i'm socializing now i'm in synagogue now i don't want to talk about business it has to be compartmentalized so um you know it's probably a paradox or an impossibility that uh that like you know saying like no you wouldn't have uh, been able to meet all those people if you had been monetizing and they wouldn't have been like the writers they want to talk to other writers they don't want someone trying to sell them life insurance on the side yeah so for me there are like 25 things that if I encounter that quality in, in someone else, it, it then immediately becomes clear that I never want to be friends with that person. So if I notice someone, you know, just makes me feel uh, ill at ease or awkward or emotionally unsafe, then I don't want to be friends with that person. If someone's a, a drug addict or uh, an alcoholic, I definitely don't want to be friends with that person. If someone's uh, dysfunctional in, in ways that could very well blow back on me. I don't want to be friends with that person. If someone's an under owner or a debtor and they're not interested in recovery in these areas, I, I don't want to be friends with those people. So th there are all these like filters that I, I put up. And I think this is fairly common that we we all say no much easier than we say yes. And so I have these filters come up that when people make me feel unsafe or unhappy or in danger, even just emotionally in danger, that I very quickly decide, okay, don't want a friendship with this person. Uh, how about for you? Do you have like 25 filters up where if someone pings them, you very quickly decide you don't want to be friends with the person or how do you, how do you play this? Yeah. I mean, two main filters and I use the expression, you know, God forbid people who do stupid, stupid stuff for no reason use i say stupid uh, s for no reason mm -hmm. and uh you know people who just engage in destructive behavior that has no benefit uh you know lack in a basic self-control that they just you know destroy something or you know like even litter or or hurt people just it's like well why'd you do that like there's no way that benefited you and it was destructive it could be in many ways like you know you take someone in your house and you know they're just gonna you know uncontrollably pick something up and then it's like oh did i break that and it's like yes you broke it you know like what you know and so that like you know like i'll keep it a, a severe distance people who have the habit of uh you know, doing stupid stuff for no reason and also people who constantly ask for things oh yeah and, and when you're in the city you can't avoid those people like in synagogue they're you know a sizable chunk especially in the Jewish community, you know, maybe even like one out of four people have that characteristic trait. But like, you know, if you came to my house and, uh, or, you know, or, or, you know, even we just met that, uh, you know, just like, you know, you know, do it. Can I get 20 bucks or like, Oh, oh. Um, you got a lot of books. Like, can I just have that? Oh. And, and so there's a lot of people that, uh, you know, just like can't control themselves doing stupid things for no reason can't control themselves they're always asking for things and if it's uh money if it, it and a lot of times like if you know coming to your house they just uh you know they want you to give them things and and so in those two cases i usually will be uh you know just uh, you know, like you said like non-starters um i could put up with like salesmen or preachers that are always trying to convince you of something i don't want to be convinced of to a certain extent, like uh, for limited friendships. And like we were talking about the benefit of yeshivish people and uh, saying like, uh, I have a lot of friends who are life insurance salesmen and mortgage brokers. And, and like every time I talk to them, they kind of ask me about, you know, if I want to buy life insurance or, you know, the real estate market or, or the various fields. And uh, so I value those connections and i'll put up with people like that like i have friends like i said they're life insurance brokers and every time i speak to them they try to sell me life insurance um but i, I put that at a lesser level than people who ask for things 
Right. I wouldn't be friends with a Nazi. I wouldn't be friends with someone who hated Jews. I wouldn't be friends with someone who was actively trying to convert me to Christianity. I wouldn't be friends with someone who tried to bully me from reading the New York Times. I wouldn't be friends with someone who frequently talked about putting people in ovens or gassing people. Uh, I wouldn't be friends with someone who's got, you know, an out of control hatred for, for out groups, or I wouldn't be friends with someone who's getting into fights. Uh, or, or someone who's particularly prone to feuding. Uh, I classify though, like people who do stupid things for no no reason. Mm -hmm. If you put like a, in, you know, people who are needy and ask for things, and people who do stupid things for no reason. And to some extent, I can handle people who are repetitive. Like, okay, if a person every time they talk to you, they're going to like hit me on my Hinduism. You're like, oh, by the way, yeah. like, you got to stop doing that. Like, it's bad. And, okay, if it's, like, just, like, one mention uh, per meeting um, or, you know, like, the New York Times or something like that, I'm not sure if you'd have, like, a limit. Like, I okay, if you have a person that wants to modify your behavior uh, and they're consistent about it, that you could maintain a friendship within limitations, uh, you know, of that. Or, or I'm not sure if... You say you can't maintain a friendship uh, if they're just going to constantly be on you. And I, I'd include that, like, people are trying to convert me to uh, Christianity. Like, you can maintain uh, your networking friendship with people as long as it's uh, you know, kept below a certain amount. Okay, I'm going to end it there. We've got a lot to talk about on the future stream. So thanks for coming on the show tonight, David. Yeah, I appreciate that. And look forward to if you're talking about the, you know, the, benefit analysis of uh racism when it when it helps you when it hurts you yep we'll do that uh, another night take care bye bye